Um, so it's really my distinct pleasure to introduce Emma Cook today. Um, she took three flights, one of which was extremely long to be here, um, has informed me that she maybe did not sleep as much last night as she would like, and therefore, if she forgets a word in English or Japanese, we will all help her, right? Okay, because many of us in the room are either currently jet lagged or have been recently jet lagged. So we are on your side. Um, she also, I was very happy to hear that she said she believes Ann Arbor is colder than Sapporo, which makes me feel happy and prideful. <laughs> I feel like that's bragging rights. Um, so Emma Cook is now an associate professor um, at, the at Hokkaido University in the Modern Japanese Studies program, which is a really wonderful and new dynamic program focused on modern Japanese studies. Um, she holds a PhD in social anthropology from SOAS, University of London, uh, an MS in social anthropology, and an, M, uh, an undergraduate degree, I'm sorry, and that's from Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh, and an undergraduate degree from the University of Liverpool. Um, you, if you've taken any classes with me, I think every class I assign some part of your work. Did you know that? Oh, okay. So if you've ever taken a class with me, you've read some, at least an article that she wrote, um, or uh, part of her book, um, which is out from Routledge, titled Reconstructing Adult Masculinities, Part-Time Work in Contemporary Japan, where she focuses on frita and masculinity. Um, today, um, she'll be talking about her newer project. Oh, I should say, the, she has another publication. We co-edited a volume that's coming out from the University of Hawaii Press later this year called Intimate Japan, Ethnographies of Closeness and Conflict. Um, so it's really genuinely been a pr privilege and pleasure to work with Emma. Um, we do a lot of work over Skype. It's nice to have actually have you here. So today, um, please join me in welcoming her to talk about embodied memory and affective imagination, experiencing food allergies in contemporary Japan. Thank you. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for such a lovely introduction and for inviting me to this uh, incredible town that you guys all live in, um, which it may not be colder, but the wind is definitely colder. Um, it kind of cuts right through you. Um, okay, so um, as Alison has so kindly already provided the title, um, I won't uh, impinge that on you again. Um, I want to um, start today um, by asking you to imagine Tokyo in August, boiling hot, super humid, the sounds of cicadas surrounding you, right? I want you to imagine that you're in one of the parks. This is one of my random photos with the color added on. It, it was a mistake on my part. Uh, but so imagine this scene. And I want you to um, then sort of imagine one of the walkways going along the lake here. Uh, now, 10-year-old Hannah Suzuki is walking along one of these lake pathways with me, poor child, and her mother. Um, and we're chatting away, uh, having a nice afternoon. Uh, she's holding hands with her mother as she walks. It's really hot. It's Tokyo in... August, and uh, lots of people, despite that, are out and about enjoying the slightly less humid, slightly cooler breeze off of the pond slash lake. Now, as we're walking, I notice that Hannah suddenly tenses just a little bit, just kind of tenses up slightly. She's noticed an ice cream coming towards her. Now, she continues to chat with me and her mom. But while she's chatting, she's kind of keeping track of where that ice cream is. As the ice cream comes closer to her, not the person, the ice cream comes closer to her, she kind of edges her body slightly to the side, towards the lake. She can swim. Um, her mum also is aware of this ice cream and tracking it. And as the ice cream comes closer, she also shifts her bodily positioning a little bit. She angles slightly forward and to the side. It's Hannah by the lake, her mum, and me. Um, and it's almost as if she's trying to protect Hannah, open a little bit of space between Hannah and this really delicious looking ice cream cone. Now, throughout all of this, the conversation is continuing. This was not an unusual occurrence for Hannah or her mother every summer um, because Hannah is actually severely allergic to milk. 
Uh, and she's also had a number of severe anaphylactic reactions. Okay. Uh, now, before I sort of talk about embodied memory and effective imagination, blah, 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 um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a heads up about food allergies and anaphylaxis for those of you who maybe have not heard much of it before. I love this picture because it kind of encapsulates uh, kind of a, a food allergic person's response to allergens on the plate. Um, <laughs> now, of course, allergens are something that allergic bodies overreact to, to varying degrees. However, in this paper today, in this talk today, I, I'm kind of arguing that allergens are also more than that. Individuals with experience of severe food allergies tend to be very attuned to the presence of their allergens in their environments. And they're attuned through kind of embodied bodily memories that give food allergens more of a meaning. It's more than a protein, right? It's something that actually could potentially have severe health ramifications. And so through embodied memory and effective imagination, I'm arguing that allergens, to an extent, become agents that are enacted through what DeAnthony has called effective correspondences. Now, of course, De Anthony, anyone who's in anthropology, Ingold is, is talking about correspondences uh, with the environment, and De Anthony is kind of drawing on that. And he argues, and I quote, that effective correspondences can be used to explore the active role that affects and bodily perceptions have in the emergence of the social through practice, as well as through coordinations, attunements, and correspondences with our environment and the various environments that make up our day-to-day -day life. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm arguing that um, food allergens actually kind of engender what Ingold has talked about as enskillment uh, and a kind of development of a problem-solving skill set. And so this talk is building on research that I've been doing on food allergies in both Japan and the UK. Uh, since 2015, although of course today I'm only talking about the Japan side. Um, I'm sure you guys aren't that interested in the UK side. Um, <clears throat> and I've been doing research uh, in Japan with uh, a non-profit organization that is working internationally as part of an international alliance of um, food allergy and anaphylaxis patient advocacy organizations. Um, but they also do a lot of work within Japan working with food manufacturers, with uh, health professionals, with the government, um, to kind of uh, try and advocate for people with allergies. Okay, so I don't need to tell all of you in this room today that food is crucial to so much more than just our physical survival. Right? We eat to live, of course, uh, but also, or well, some of us at least, live to eat, some more so than others. Um, most of our relationships with others involve the consumption of food and drink. I mean, the last time you guys were social, it probably involved eating in some shape or form. I mean, some of you are even eating now, right? <laughs> it's fine, Alison. Keep going. <laughs> Excellent. Um, as one woman in Japan said uh, in 2017 last year, food is relationships, isn't it? And it was shoku wa kanke desu ne. Our social bonds, our kinship relationships, our friendships, our work relationships, these often revolve around food, and, they st and it strengthens what it means to be a person in a social network. Food is therefore at the center of our human life. And so relationships in all of their various types can actually become really, really complicated when people have food allergies and when they have to refuse eating certain foods. Um, and this is true in the UK, it's true in the US, it's also true in Japan. But one of the interesting things about Japan that really sort of fits into this idea of tracking that I'm going to talk more about today is that there's also an emphasis on sharing the same food in Japan. I mean, for those of you who have been in Japan and you go out to an izakaya, it's not like everyone has their own plate of their own food which they eat, alone eat, right? There's dishes around the table. 
Okay, so food allergy, I've already said, is basically an overreaction, an immune overreaction um, in response to something that's normally harmless. Uh, in this case, food proteins. Now, despite the fact that we have sort of labelings of specific allergens, it is, in fact, possible to be allergic to any food. And one of the fun facts coming out of uh, immunology conferences at the moment is that you can literally be allergic to, you know, bugs and cochineal and all kinds of things, like random stuff. Okay? Uh, in Japan, the top seven allergens uh, that are mandatory to label on prepackaged food are shrimp, crab, uh, wheat, buckwheat, egg, milk, and peanuts. Okay. In addition, the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries uh, recommends the labeling of 20 other allergens. And I'm going to give you this list. Please excuse me. It's a bit of a long list. But it's abalone, squid, salmon roe, orange, cashew nut, kiwi, beef, walnut, sesame, salmon, mackerel, soybean, chicken, banana, pork, matsutake mushroom, peach, yam, apple, and gelatin. So a really specific list. And you'll notice that actually specific fish are labeled, but not the entire category of fish. Okay? Um, and this is, was actually done in uh, collaboration with um, allergists in Japan and the government. Um, and allergists, of course, fish is a big deal in Japan, so they didn't want to limit uh, people's choice to eat other fish if they're only allergic to one or two types of fish. Okay. In the US, just for context, um, I'm sure all of you are aware that the major allergens in legislation uh, are eight food groups, um, milk, egg, fish, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, and soybeans. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's kind of more of a comprehensive labeling rather than specific, although of course milk is very specific. There are also a growing number of people around the world with food allergies, uh, and many of course discover these allergies when they're chi children, um, but there are also an increasing number of uh, adult onset food allergies, where people, and I don't mean to scare any of you in the room, where, however, people who've been able to eat walnuts for 50 years suddenly develop um, severe reactions out of the blue, right? Um, and so there's research going on in that. In Japan, the statistics are a little bit hazy, uh, but basically it's estimated that about 4.5% of school-aged children, 5 to 10% of infants, and between 1.3 and 4.5% of adults are estimated to have food allergies. And of course, um, adult um, diagnosis is actually really underrepresented in Japan. And there are actually no specific adult allergists. It's all pediatric. There is also um, an increase in the severity of food allergy reactions. Um, and again, this is something that we're seeing globally. Um, hospital admissions for anaphylaxis in the UK, for example, between 1992 and 2012 went up 615 percent, which is a big, big jump. We don't have definite data from Japan, but there is also, from speaking to allergists, there does seem to be an increase in hospitalizations in Japan too. This isn't, however, just from uh, increased knowledge of the risk of food allergies and therefore a uh, potential preventative uh, trip to the emergency room, but actually does seem to be an increase in severity. And so, um, of course, allergic reactions can be either mild to severe. Uh, mild reactions may include something like hives. Uh, they may include mild swelling of the lips or the face. Um, however, in severe cases, um, individuals can experience anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock. And this is basically defined as a reaction of more than one bodily system. And so symptoms for this can include, but don't have to include, can include hives, swollen throat, swollen other areas of the body, wheezing, dizziness, passing out, chest tightness, cardiac arrhythmia, um, trouble breathing, trouble swallowing, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach cramping, and my absolute favorite, a feeling of impending doom. Um, yeah. Now, of course, anaphylaxis is the biggest uh, risk to those with food allergies because it, it can and it does lead to death. And in fact, uh, some of you may be aware in the U.S. on March 6th, a young girl in Georgia, a 12-year-old girl in Georgia, 
uh, very sadly uh, took a bite of a granola bar on the school bus that she had eaten many, many times before, had a sudden reaction, and two days later, uh, very, very sadly, she died. Now, of course, um, you're still more likely to die in a car accident, fun fact. Um, but the point is, is that uh, food allergy um, advocates, charities, uh, NPOs, argue that these are all preventable deaths. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you have this potential risk, it makes the management of allergies really an integral part of the life of those who have food allergies, uh, especially those who have experienced anaphylaxis and, and carry auto-injectors um, auto of adrenaline with them as their first line of treatment. Now, some of you may have seen sort of funny sketches in TV shows about the use of auto-injectors, and Alison's kindly sent me a few over the years, over the last couple of years. Um, I, I want to stress that um, they don't always work, okay? And it's really important that they are administered in the correct way and that then people go to hospital straight away. So I'm only saying that not for the talk, but in case you experience someone that you know having a reaction, uh, do please uh, use their auto-injector and send them to the hospital. Okay. So, in this paper, I'm, or in this talk, I should say, I'm only actually going to be discussing uh, the embodied memory and the effective imagination of individuals, um, teenagers primarily, and parents of children in Japan who have experienced anaphylaxis. And the main reason, other than time consideration, is that individuals who have experienced anaphylaxis do tend to have much stronger embodied memories um, and have developed clearer embodied skill sets to manage their allergies as a result of these experiences. They tend to have spent more time thinking about allergens and more time and energy on managing allergen anxiety. Um, their food allergy experiences are therefore more present in their lives uh, than individuals who have thus far only experienced milder reactions. And so the material that I'm going to draw on today comes specifically from a summer camp for children who have food allergies, uh, asthma and eczema as well, or either asthma, eczema, food allergies. Um, and I've been attending that every year since 2015. Uh, it's a great, fun three-day event. Uh, usually around 100 people attend. Um, and that's usually about 20 to 25 parents with approximately 30 kids uh, and about 40 to 50 volunteers who are making it all go smoothly many of whom also have food allergies, asthma and eczema themselves, or have been involved with the MPO at some point in their lives, or their parents have been involved. Okay, now I started this talk um, with the example of Hannah, the young girl who tracks. This kind of tracking behavior is, of course, learned and developed. It's not like you're born with the innate ability to suddenly track your allergens, right? It's part of an embodied problem-solving skill set that's emerged out of her previous experiences, but also, crucially, out of her emotional and effective imagination of what could happen to her if she were to ingest milk. Now, Ingold has argued that, and I'm going to quote, skill is not an attribute of the individual body in isolation, but of the whole system of relations constituted by the presence of the artisan in his or her environment. It involves qualities of care, judgment, and dexterity." End of quote. And so the development of food allergy skill sets is, I argue, a process of enskillment, which is what Ingold argues is conceived as the embodiment of capacities of awareness and response by environmentally situated agents. Now, of course, Ingold is drawing on Gibson um, and, and is observing basically an education of attention. Yeah. And this is an education of attention to allergens in the wider environment, in which learning is inseparable from doing, and in which both are embedded in the context of a practical engagement in the world. Okay. This happens through intersubjective and intercorporeal embodied memories and practices. It involves other people as well as the individual with allergens themselves. It's part of an effective entanglement with others, uh, not just her allergen, but with other humans as well, and non-humans, microbes. I'm going to talk about microbes not here, but at the AAS. 
Um, she's learned certain ways of being with her allergies from these previous experiences, but also critically from her parents. And I should say, specifically from her mother, right? And in Japan, it's often, I'm sure all of you know, with the gender dynamics in Japan, it's, it's often women who are doing the main caretaking, especially around food, not always, but it, that is a, a, a general sort of uh, pattern. And definitely in the case of food allergies, it is the mothers who are most primarily dealing with, with that. Okay? And so Young, for example, has argued that parents basically offer kids a model of how to be, uh, and I quote, embodied in the form of corporeal dispositions, that children apprehend their, their parents' bodies as solutions to the ontological problem of how to be in the world. Okay? Now, of course, imagination is a core part of this process with regards to food allergies. Uh, Sneath and colleagues um, have argued that we need to move beyond understanding imagination through cognitive definitions, and instead that we should be understanding imagination as a process and a capacity. And they argue, and I'm going to give you a bit of a longer quote because they say it better than I can, uh, but I quote, there is no a priori substantive distinction to be made between, say, the role of the imagination as a continuous aspect of perception, so for example, allowing us to perceive the shape of an object when only one side of that object is visible to you, uh, as well as its ability to let us imagine characters or situations that we have never experienced. So rather than some special form of cognition, we are dealing with a capacity involved in everything from the basic perception of objects um, to our environment with entirely immaterial knowledge, end of quote. So imagination can project us into possible future events, but it is not separate from the present. Imagining possible food allergy reactions emerges not only from prior knowledge of potential repercussions, but also from past and present bodily engagement in the world, of both one's own body, but also of others, for example, parents, or school friends, or teachers or restaurant staff, right? Um, <clears throat> it's an effective projection of the possible, right? Uh, and it's a potential based on past and present bodily experience alongside knowledge. Now, of course, experiences of allergic reactions leave their mark in different ways on different people to greater and lesser extents. Although children and their parents have different embodied experiences of these allergic reactions from, of course, different positionalities, they do actually share memories of it that influence the day-to-day -day present. So one mother emotionally conveyed to me um, uh, during a conversation at the summer camp uh, about her son's school and, and food experiences in the following way. She said, um, I make him bento pack lunch every day which he takes to school. It's hard on him. So everyone's having two shoku, right? Sharing the same food in the classroom. But not only that, he's really scared to eat food, which I think is my fault because I'm really negative about new foods. His teacher this year seems good, but it's a lot of responsibility to give her. And I can't really trust that she'll be careful especially after that child died in Chofu City in Tokyo. And a bit of backstory on that, um, the child, I think it was 2013, she had eaten a specially prepared uh, meal for Kyushoku. She was in the Kyushoku program, uh, but she went back for seconds. And it was when they gave her seconds that the mistake happened. Okay, so she said, she continued, you know, I'm, I'm afraid he'll react, have a bad reaction. Uh, so now he is scared too. His reactions are quite bad, so I make him a bento. But then he eats separately from the rest of the class. He's very shy and quiet, and he doesn't have many friends. I feel so guilty. As you can see, I have bad eczema and other allergies, so he got it from me. I think it's my fault. So there's a lot going on, right, in, in that quote, not only about how she is transmitting a certain way of being with allergens to him, uh, but also uh, a lot of social aspects as well. Yeah? 
Now, this mother was working really hard to try and help her son eat new foods. It was her first time at the summer camp. Um, but as you can see, she was riddled with guilt. Now, other members at the camp, uh, other mothers at the camp were there at the same time, and they were really understanding of this woman, but they also said to her that she needed to work harder to control her emotion and her responses. They understood. They really understood her feelings, but they, they said it's, it's really difficult. Now, of course, some people are more successful than others at doing this, and one woman uh, had this to say um, just, just after, during this conversation. Uh, my child has had a number of reactions, and it is so scary when it happens. But you have to stay calm to try and keep them calm. You give the adrenaline auto injector, call the ambulance, reassure them, stay with them in the ambulance and hospital. Later, when you're alone, you really feel it, but not in front of them. I don't want my children to be scared of eating. They have to learn to live in the world with their allergens. I'm going to go back to memory. Connaughton, way back in 1989, so a longer time for some than others. Some of us remember 1989 very well. Uh, has argued that while memory is often considered to be individual, it is, of course, also shared and collective. And Connaughton, uh, and I'm going to quote what Connaughton says, um, we experience our present world in a context which is causally connected with past events and objects, and hence with reference to events and objects, which we are not experiencing when we are experiencing the present. We will experience our present differently in accordance with the different pasts to which we are able to connect that present. Hence, the difficulty of extracting our past from our present. Not simply because present factors tend to influence our recollections of the past, but also because past factors tend to influence our experience of the present. This process, it should be stressed, reaches into the most minute and everyday details of our lives. And so people like Kidron have sort of built on um, some of Connaughton's arguments to uh, talk about uh, embodied memory. Okay? And Kidron uh, has it as uh, this quote here, a pre-reflexive or a-reflexive experience of memory, namely the imprints of the past on the sensuous body, the imprints of pain, pleasure, the smell or taste of home cooking, someone's touch, or the embodied memory of trauma and the intersubjectively transmitted embodied memories of trauma. Now, Kidron works actually on intergenerational um, trauma. Now, in my work, I found that these kinds of imprints are present even in people, interestingly, who have no conscious memory of a severe allergic reaction. So, for example, when you've had a really severe allergic reaction at age one, right, or 14 months. Um, these people do also develop embodied skill sets to manage their allergies, but these are not built out necessarily out of their kind of conscious individual embodied memories. Perhaps it comes out of their embodied, non-conscious memories, right? But crucially, this is where the kind of uh, intersubjective aspects come in, right? It, it comes out of the embodied memories and responses of others, particularly parents, and their consequent behaviors. Now, in these kinds of cases, I mean, to only have one anaphylactic reaction and to not have another one often means that there has been quite considerable uh, vigilant care taken uh, to avoid allergens and really close management of food in all social settings. And so for these people, it's a lot about what could happen to them again, right, rather than their memories of it. Now, individuals who've had multiple or singular reactions do have different strategies and different problem-solving skill sets to handle the management of their allergies. This is often mediated by age and stage of life. Of course, young kids are relying on their parents. Um, and of course, it depends on family as to how long a child will rely on their parents to do that. 
Um, but these kids are typically not overly aware of uh, the work that goes into managing these allergens. Um, as children become older and become teenagers, however, I've been doing work with some teenagers, we've been, done some focus groups. Um, I ran a workshop last summer, um, and I'm going to be doing workshops this summer as well. Uh, these, these people are still typically um, learning how to communicate and manage their allergens, and they take different strategies. Okay? And there seems to be a bit of a gender dynamic going on as well, but I'm a bit hesitant to, to say that definitively at this point. I'm sure there is, but um, I'm not going to bang on about it yet. That would be a different talk. Uh, some of the teenagers and some of the adults that I've worked with um, in Japan do communicate very directly uh, with friends and families about their allergies. Um, and they tend to actively participate uh, in sort of getting their friends and family to learn how to read labels and to kind of become an advocate for them, right? But this seems to be relatively few who feel comfortable doing this. And it seems to be more of the girls who seem comfortable in engaging others to maintain safety. Um, others avoid social interactions outside of what they have to do at school or work uh, by refusing invitations. Others go to events and social events, uh, but have a policy to not eat. Others go and they try to eat, depending on the response of the establishment and if their allergies can be catered for and how they feel and who they're with, and if they're healthy at that moment in time, and what their mood is. There are lots of different things that go into this. Um, and many of these strategies are critically not only about remaining physically safe, but crucially, it's about social management. It's strategies to mitigate and avoid the social side of food allergies, uh, managing other people's reactions to the declaration of food allergies, uh, and of course, as any of you who know anything about food allergies, even in the US context, know that this is kind of a socially and politically fraught positioning to be in. I'm sure you guys have heard about you know, potential nut bans in airplanes and in schools and these kinds of things, right? And then there's pushback, people with allergies shouldn't fly, these kinds of things. In Japan, seriously, not one person that I have spoken to is on board for any kind of ban of allergens. It's all about learning to live with the allergen, manage the situation, take individual responsibility, um, but also to have people on your side to try and facilitate cooperation rather than antagonism, yeah? Or this is my right. And of course, this is culturally contextual, yeah? Um, and there's also a lot about, you know, how illness works in Japan, chronic illness works in Japan, how disability works in Japan in different ways. Yeah. Okay, so when Hannah and her mom physically edged aside out of the way of the ice cream, they of course did not expect that ice cream to suddenly jump off of the cone. Woohoo, there's an allerg allergic person, right? Of course. Um, but what they wanted was to distance themselves and they knew where they were in relation. Now, not all people with severe allergies vigilantly track their allergies in their environment, as obviously. But most do talk about how, if they are out and about, and their allergens are, especially in Japan, on an izakaya table, and the plates are being moved from one side of the table to the other side of the table, they know where their allergies are. And they're talking the whole time, but they're constantly, you know, like closing your drink. Just little things, right? To, to be aware. It's not a conscious process per se. It's a tactic, it's a kind of embodied response. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about awareness and then I'll get on to the, uh, some examples from the camp. Now, embodied memory, is, as any of you who uh, work with this kind of material know, it's often discussed in literature on trauma as well as illness and aging. And many individuals who experience a severe allergic reaction, of course, experience it as a scary, traumatic event. In recent years, there's been a, a growing body of literature on, in psychology, looking at, you know, in psycho, I can never say this, psycho, psychosociology? No, whatever, forget it. We'll move on. Psychology, let's go with that. Um, uh, basically looking at uh, psychosocial um, 
impacts of anaphylaxis. And th I mean, there are clear links um, showing impaired quality of life, uh, heightened anxiety, depression um, in different places. Uh, in the UK, in the US, we see this very clearly. There isn't really any psychosocial work coming out of Japan that I've seen yet. Uh, but there's also clear links being made to trauma and PTSD after anaphylaxis. Um, <clears throat> so in a UK study uh, done by Chung and colleagues, 12% of their people who had experienced anaphylactic shock um, met the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Over half of their respondents experienced many of the symptoms associated with PTSD, but were not severe enough to meet diagnostic criteria. Uh, avoidance symptoms were among the highest cited. I mean, surprise, surprise, right? Of course you're going to try and avoid what you're allergic to. Um, but that's not a critique of their work. I'm being facetious and jet-lagged right now. Uh, <laughs> common themes that emerge uh, in narratives in, in this work that they've done after a severe allergic reaction are fear of food, of course, um, even of safe foods that they have been able to eat previously, hypervigilance regarding allergens, and a need to control food environments. Now, typically, they found that these responses lessen uh, for the individual after some time passes, but also depending on their support network. Now, in the UK and US, uh, we're starting to see parents turn to psychological services, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, to help them through fear and anxiety. Um, in the UK, now with um, uh, desensitization oral immunotherapy treatments, um, in trials, because in the UK it's all trials only, uh, they now have in-house people offering psychological care. But there are no dedicated services uh, in Japan for food allergy patients. I have not met one person who has um, talked to anybody outside of their family or the NPO with regards to their food allergies. Uh, the NPO, the summer camp in particular, is really a space where a lot of this gets hashed out among the parents. Uh, as to what kind of management techniques they can put in place and how to manage the fear of their kids and their own fear. Now, of course, although avoidance and hypervigilance are symptoms of PTSD, many people with food allergies are situationally aware and they're vigilant, right? But they don't have PTSD. Um, attention to allergens is really a way of life for many with severe food allergies. And so the line between vigilance and hypervigilance is quite complicated. Now, a messenger has argued, albeit in a different situation, in the context of injured US veterans who have returned from combat. So, of course, it's a very different situation. But messengers argued that attention to detail and situational awareness are not necessarily the result of PTSD, or, although you could diagnose it in that way, uh, but are the result of consistent embodied military training programs which are experienced as a positive legacy, perhaps a complicated positive legacy, don't know, uh, of their military training which sets them apart from civilians. Um, and he, um, Messenger is, is looking at attention and hypervigilance as existing on a continuum where, and I quote, attention is the experience of simply noticing something up through carefully engaging with a task and object or some other stimuli, whereas hypervigilance is the other end of this con continuum. It's the constant search for something to attend to. Uh, he argues that whilst attention and hypervigilance are sometimes interpreted or oftentimes interpreted in, in, in the context of his work as symptoms of PTSD, we can also interpret these emotional experiences as part of the cognitive and emotional makeup of a specific kind of experience and identity. Um, it's about a set of practices that have a profound effect on shaping identity. And so, in a similar but different way, um, I'm kind of arguing that food allergies um, and, and anaphylactic reactions and the kind of embodied experiences and skill sets that emerge from these um, experiences engender practices and skills that ultimately shape identities and actions in quite specific ways, which are not necessarily linked to um, psychological illnesses, okay. although it might seem a bit weird and a bit much to someone without food allergies. Yeah. Now, one young woman that I interview, I'm going to give you a quite an extended quote, so it's not all up there, uh, had this to say about her allergy. 
Uh, I always check about my allergens. How I do it depends on the situation. If I'm with friends who know about my allergies, I'll check the labels in front of them. Over the years, they've learned how to read the labels too, and they're careful. When we go out to eat, they always check if I can go there. Or we just go to McDonald's. My university club, though, is more difficult. I have many allergies, and I don't feel comfortable eating out with them. Um, I have to ask the wait staff about my allergies, and all of the attention is on me if I start suddenly asking. I don't want them to think I'm difficult. Also, they often eat in places I can't really go to. I went once to this izakaya with them. A couple of my allergies were on the table. They were passing plates around. I was really aware of where the plates were. Uh, they offered them to me, and I said no. So now I usually don't go out with them, as it's too difficult and a bit stressful. And sometimes I feel sad about it. But that's just the way it is. So how I manage my allergies depends on who I'm with, where we are, and how comfortable I feel to say about it. But I don't eat unless I'm as sure as I can be that it's safe. I have met one adult that will actually eat her allergen if pushed in Japan. And she'll sit there quietly having a reaction. And she actually has adult onset allergies, and she's not been to a doctor, and she doesn't have an auto-injector. Um, and so, you know, this, this, this person is, is quite straight down the line about it, but not everybody is quite as uh, straight down the line. So attention and uh, situational awareness uh, that results in kind of food allergen tracking are, as Chordas would argue, somatic modes of attention that have emerged from memory experience and future potentialities. And I'm going to turn now to how this kind of vigilance and situational awareness is reinforced through shared practice and illustrate this through a discussion of the, the summer camp that I've been attending in Japan since 2015. Um, this is just uh, a few of the, uh, of, of the tents. There's also tents all the way around here as well. Yeah. Um, <coughs> for the past 23 years, uh, the nonprofit organization that I've been working with has, has run this summer camp uh, for kids with food allergies, asthma, and eczema, always in August out west of Tokyo, always boiling. Um, children with food allergies, uh, of course, it's not surprising, uh, typically struggle to attend summer camps as a result of the real and perceived difficulties of accommodating their specific food needs. And so the camp taps into this. It really operates as a space where everyone can eat the same food together. Okay? And of course, you all know that this is a really important cultural ideal. Um, which is introduced, of course, from school, right, with Kyushoku, and even earlier. Um, and so I'm going to turn super briefly to, to a recent um, commercial. Uh, we see this kind of emphasis on the importance of shared food and same food um, on TV as well. This one uh, specifically is from Eon, which is a supermarket and food manufacturer, who have been using this kind of idea to sell their new top seven allergen-free food range. Um, but we see very, very similar discourses from house manufacturer um, uh, SNB as well. Anyway, hopefully this will work. It's all in Japanese. It's 30 seconds. For those of you who don't know Japanese yet, I'll tell you the bit that's relevant to what I'm talking about in a minute. ホワイトソース。特定原材料7品目を使わない食品をもっと美味しくしたいと思いました。ホワイトソースでグラタンとクリームコロッケみんな一緒だいっぱい食べてねせーのおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいおいしいお
Um, yeah. And, you know, the mum doesn't have to cook. She can just ping. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the summer camp. Now, ostensibly, the summer camp is a place where kids, teens, and parents can relax from the demands of food allergy vigilance, right? The ethos is to keep kids and parents separated as much as possible so that the kids can feel independent or can start to feel independent. Um, however, at mealtimes, everybody does congregate uh, into the same general area with kids, teens, and volunteers uh, sitting on uh, the you know, beautiful blue plastic. Everyone who's been in Japan uh, understands the allure of the blue plastic. Um, and obviously, they sit with new and old friends to, to eat. The adults are sit seated on wooden tables on really rickety chairs. It makes every year quite exciting uh, off to the side. Okay. Uh, now, the organizing committee um, basically stresses every year that children and parents should not interact. And what they really mean is that parents should not interact with their kids. If there are any issues or concerns, they are to be taken up with staff or volunteers. And the rationale is, is to try and give them an independent summer camp experience like any other regular kid could experience. And so kids spend their days and nights outside uh, with teen and adult volunteers. They sleep in the tents. Um, adults sleep in shared, in shared? Okay. shared tatami mats up in this uh, building. Uh, normally, there's about four of us in a room. Uh, now, while the kids are out having fun on the river, catching bugs, doing all the things that Japanese kids do in uh, at summer camps, the parents are attending seminars and workshops on a variety of topics and usually also have a chance to give feedback to invited food manufacturers on things like labeling, on the taste, on variety. So Eon actually developed this after really close interaction with parents who were like, yeah, we've got curry. There's loads of allergen-free curry, but we can't eat curry all the time. I mean, some of us could, but anyway. But, you know, they wanted more choice. Um, last year we had, or they had, we had um, McDonald's Research Institute come in. Um, and that was a really interesting workshop, uh, which I won't talk about today, but it's super interesting. Now, um, it's also a really important social space for parents. In the evening, there's an outside bar for the adults to get together, buy cans of beer, other kinds of alcohol, soft drinks, if you prefer. Uh, sit under the candlelight, under the, in the candlelight, under the stars, swapping experiences and stories. You know, they talk about schools, about wider family and friend issues. They swap information on doctors a lot uh, and medical clinics, as well as catching up with people they've met before. For new participants, you can almost see this palpable relief at being in this space. Uh, for older participants or old hands, really, it's a chance to catch up, not have to cook for a few days, um, hang out with friends, gossip, um, impart knowledge, right? It's, it's, it's a convivial atmosphere. Now, as already noted, one of the main features of the camp is that everyone should be able to eat the same food together. And so when you send your application in to, to, to go to the camp, there's a section on the form in which to write allergens and medication. The camp organizers compile this information. They're in conversation with the volunteer chef. They plan the menu mostly stayed the same in the last few years with a few changes. Uh, menu information, including allergen lists, is then sent to all of the attendees at the camp with a request to check if, anything, if everything is okay. So the focus is on doing all of the food allergen checking and preparation before arrival so that parents and kids can feel confident that they can eat safely. So the subtext is that it's a space where individuals and parents can relax. Okay. Um, in the event that a mix-up should occur, however, everyone's well-trained, right? So, theoretically, I don't think it's ever happened. Uh, but, you know, people know that it, when you give an EpiPen or an auto-injector, you lie the person on the floor, you raise their legs, because in anaphylactic shock, uh, the veins and capillaries basically leak, and so you need to get blood back to the heart, because otherwise you have a heart attack. Um, that kind of thing, right? But at the same time as this kind of relaxation, at every meal, there are these beautiful handmade um, ingredient lists next to every bowl. Okay? So it's simultaneously a place to be trusted where vigilance and situational awareness are not needed or not so needed, as well as a space where awareness and vigilance is discussed and encouraged as a daily practice of living with food allergies. And so these signs are operating on different levels, right? 
Uh, not only are they pretty and often photographed, I mean, people are uploading them to Facebook, you know, oh, look at this great food we ate. Um, but, you know, they're also there for individual comfort, uh, but they're also a reminder that checking ingredients is something that should be an ingrained every day, every dish, every meal occurrence. Yeah. And so it's a continued socialization and reinforcement of this practice. For many, uh, these practices have become, or are on the way to becoming, uh, an embodied skill set. And I'm going to give you one last example. Uh, last day of the 2016 summer camp. Um, we finish at 12.30 on the last day. So everyone heads off on train to go back to wherever they're from. And so the volunteer um, chefs make different onigiri rice balls uh, for us to take. Uh, every year, three different types are prepared. Pickled plum, salmon, and uh, dried vegetable seasoning. So it's pretty kake. Right? Uh, as well as this, everyone receives prepackaged top seven allergen-free tomato meatballs and or a hamburger. Yeah. Uh, now, for pretty much everyone at the camp, these are safe foods. But every year, there are two or three individuals, myself included, with fish allergies. Now, when I approached the food area in 2016, full of confidence, not bothered, whatever, it's all safe. Uh, one young volunteer, I noticed, had fish flakes on her hand, salmon flakes, as she was making up fresh on a jury. So I paused, obviously, and I kind of watched for a while. And I realized that she wasn't just making the salmon rice ball, she was making others as well, and she wasn't washing her hands before or in between, so she basically had cross-contaminated all of the onigiri because People with fish allergies had no idea how many she had made. Okay. Um, I searched out the other participant with fish allergy, uh, a young woman. Um, and she had, coincidentally, seen the same thing um, and had kind of been looking for me. Um, and she'd taken extra meatballs instead of on any onigiri. So we'd both continued to be vigilant and situationally aware, even though we'd both been to the camp before, had no qualms about it, right? But really interestingly, there was kind of a code of silence among us, yeah? Neither of us um, went to the organizers and told them, or told the volunteer chefs that this had happened. And silence seems to be part of the tracking experience in Japan. The individual is aware, tracks, makes decisions without wanting to talk about it or making it the focus of anyone else's awareness. Now, I know why I didn't say anything at the time, but I asked Aki, of course, and she basically came out with, they've been working solid for four days in really, really hot weather to prepare great safe meals for us. I'm going home. I can wait a few hours to eat. I didn't want to create any meiwaku, any bother, okay? Now, I mentioned the cross-contamination to the organizers the next time that I went for a meeting, um, just so they could bring it up when, when training the, the next year volunteers. And at 2017 camp, they had not only reiterated the dangers of cross-contamination, but they'd pre-prepared white plain rice balls for me and Aki, put them on a separate plate in a different part of the outdoor kitchen. Uh, when we both approached at the same time by chance, um, the main chef pulled out the tray and asked us to choose the, the however many we wanted. There were quite a few. I was like, how much do you think I eat? But this is great. Uh, I was very happy. Um, and then said, please, please fill it yourself. Interestingly, we both had them plain. Now, um, for people, of course, with um, food allergies, um, without food allergies, and even for people with food allergies, this kind of tracking and vigilance and consistent awareness um, around food can seem to be an overreaction. It can seem a bit weird to other people. Um, but for most, basically, this is um, practices of attention that have been built from their embodied memories, experiences, and imagination of what could happen to them in the future, um, and really are pra practices of uh, safety and risk reduction. Um, I'm going to leave it there, because I think I've spoken enough. Uh, and so I'm going to say thank you very much for your attention, and I welcome your comments and questions. Okay.
feel free to hit me with them. Not literally, of course. Yeah. As someone with food allergies that particularly has experienced bullying using my food allergens, such as bullies trying to force feed yeah. me my allergens, yeah. does this occur in Japan as yeah. well? And are there any things that are being done specifically for it? Yeah, it's a great question. And unfortunately, food allergy bullying does happen in Japan. Um, really, uh, responses, I mean, the, the, the NPO that I've been working with um, does a lot of outreach to schools and goes into schools and, and does kind of card games saying, please imagine that you are now allergic to X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, and you have to decide what you're going to eat. And they, they do a lot of that kind of work to try and make people understand the reality for, uh, for those with food allergies. Um, but there is no kind of consistent policy. It depends on the school. It depends on the teachers. Um, you know, the, the NPO does get phone calls from parents saying, what can I do? Uh, they'll intercede and they'll talk to, to teachers and that kind of thing. But otherwise, no, there's, there's, it's an issue that is yet to have a solution. Yeah. Humans suck. Anywhere in the world, is there any good desensitizing program for people to make their lives and their parents and everybody else around them a little bit easier? Yeah, another wonderful question. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of research that's going into uh, oral immunotherapy treatments specifically. Uh, but every, everywhere is doing different things. So um, in the UK, you can only do these kinds of sen desensitization um, uh, practices um, if you're in a trial, because they really want evidence that it works, because there is risk involved in basically, for those of you who don't know oral immunotherapy, um, you start with a really tiny amount of the allergen and you start to try and build tolerance to the allergen uh, over a period of time. And there's fast and slow. In Japan, they, they basically do slow oral immunotherapy. And I've met someone who's been doing it for 20 years for their egg allergy and it, they're still allergic to egg. So, you know, um, basically it doesn't work for everybody. Um, if you uh, stop taking your allergen, so for example, peanut in trials that we've seen um, or in some trial data, there seems to be, if you stop taking the peanut every day after three or four months, your allergy comes back. Um, but the big hope is that what, it, what, what doctors hope it will do is to increase your, uh, your tolerance enough so that your immune response will not be so severe to send you into anaphylaxis, so you'll have more time to treat the reaction. Um, that being said, there have been close calls, and I think there have been a couple of deaths or one death in the trial recently. I'm not sure if that's true. I feel like there has been. Um, so there's a lot of debate about it. Yeah, please. Um, I'm not aware of any work that's been done, but I will definitely look it up. Uh, what I would probably suggest, I mean, I'm not an immunologist or an allergist, so um, apologies if anyone is an immunologist or allergist in the room. I don't, don't know if anyone is. Um, but I would suggest that, um, I mean, allergen reactions, food allergy reactions are immune responses, physiological immune responses. There is, of course, a psychological anxiety that comes with a response. So for example, if you look at um, when people have done research on, on food allergies and, and anxiety, there is sometimes a link between panic attacks, like the feeling that you've got something lodged in your throat, you feel impending doom, that you're gonna die. And of course, impending doom is also a feature of, uh, of anaphylaxis as well, right? So um, it could be that in those cases, those people are less anxious in that particular personality, and therefore they're not actually having a reaction, they would have been having a panic attack or, or an emotional psychological reaction. Um, 
but it, it's it's very difficult. I mean, it's I think it's kind of risky to emphasize or focus too much on the psychological component because that can actually mitigate people's response to go to a hospital and get treatment. Yeah, I mean, there's huge amounts of work to be done. Yeah. 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 Hi. Oh, my apologies. Oh, it's all good. So I had a question regarding whether responses and coping uh, varies by socioeconomic background because yeah. not everyone can afford to have these fancy foods and yeah. their choice of food is limited by that. Yeah. Um, a really, really wonderful question. Uh, and in the Japanese context, it's kind of tough for me to answer you definitively. Um, one of the things that a lot of... Oh, there's different aspects here. So a lot of the mums that I've met really focus on making food from scratch, so not buying Eon's right. food, which is more expensive than buying a daikon and making some miso soup or whatever, right? Um, so there's that, but then there are like full-time working parents who don't have the time to make elaborate bentos. So there's definitely um, anxiety around the amount of time that is available to manage allergens. Uh, that being said, I'm only working so far with people who are attending this camp. Um, and there are people from Fukushima, for example, who went and they, they were able to go. I think they were funded to go because of obviously um, their experiences in the earthquake. Uh, but everybody else is paying to, to go. Um, so it's really hard for me to say. There is actually um, the, the American uh, Food Allergy Research, uh, Food Allergy, Edu no, FAIR, Food Allergy Research and Education Organization is about to do a, a, a world kind of socioeconomic burden study. Um, and so that's something that is, is desperately needed. Yeah. But it's something I'm very aware of as I'm working and I'm trying to kind of keep an eye on it, but I don't have any answers for you yet. Okay. Thank but thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I, I was curious about this organization, the NCO. It yeah. seems like it's been around for a long time. Do you have a sense for what people did before that organization was around. How did they cope? What did yeah. they uh, And then what's the organization's sense of its own history in light of the fact that the number of people with FA seems to be increasing so much over time? Yeah, great questions. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, the woman who, who set up the nonprofit um, has food allergies herself, and her son has food allergies. And it's interesting. Um, adults are typically feel that they don't need any help necessarily to manage. They, they take it on themselves to manage. But as soon as kids get involved and as soon as schools get involved, it then becomes very much an ichi, going to the school, talking to, to staff members with greater and lesser um, success, right? Uh, and so the reason that the, that the lady set it up was because she realized that there needed to be more of a support for people who didn't know how to navigate or who were unable to communicate with teachers who perhaps didn't have any clue about what was being discussed or any consideration. Um, for her, you know, people would take their own food. They wouldn't have kyushoku, for example. Uh, one of the interesting things in Japan at the moment is that although the Ministry of Education has a kyushoku policy, and their policy is that every child should be able to eat a safe kyushoku, every prefecture has different recommendations and every school can then decide whether to follow those recommendations or not and there is absolutely nothing that anyone can do if a school says no we're not helping you so osaka has a universal lunch policy and they they, they have like uh, where the food is prepared it's all kind of specially segregated you know allergen free areas uh, whereas other places are just like we're not taking the risk um, as to the sense of history, um, I think that um, there's been some interesting shifts. So um, maybe 10 years ago, the NPO was more focused on eczema. Uh, and there was kind of a big surge of uh, the use of steroid creams and then kind of, I um, can't remember what it's called, Ushiyama Miho has done work on this, uh, looking at people who were using steroids for years and years and they stop and then they have awful flare-ups of eczema. So there was a lot of work being done on that aspect. 
And then in the last five years, their, their focus has sort of shifted onto food allergies more and to working more with, with food manufacturers, although it's always been an, an element. Uh, one of the really interesting things about this organization in Japan is it's not like it's the biggest organization, but it's not a national organization. There are lots of different support groups all over the country. Um, and they um, basically work really closely with doctors from certain medical facilities, uh, government officials from different government departments, um, food manufacturers, people who are on food and drink manufacturers. And so like, there's this kind of group that got together to set up the labeling laws through the government. Uh, back in 2001, I think that came through. So they've, they've, they've been very instrumental in um, food allergy awareness in, in Japan. And yet, you know, they have no money and they financially really, really struggle. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. And um, I would like to go back to the psychosocial yeah. uh, question. And I realize it's a probably heavily different ethnography uh, to be made there. But um, so I, my partner seven years ago developed uh, a variety of food intolerances. Mm -hmm. Some were backed by allergies okay. and others not. And what we realized after many years of struggle is that there was definitely it wasn't just stress, but it was, and in, in you know, in, in your examples, there's a lot of attention to the environment, both uh, the, the place, the surroundings, and and the social environments, in dovetailing with the maybe not really the the heating of the allergy or the seriousness of the anaphylactic response, mm -hmm. but in a way with these uh, levels of uh, of anxiety and 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 the way in which they they structured uh, the embodied memory which mm -hmm. is definitely something that uh, in a way we now understood to be primarily important in the way in which she she responded to certain allergies i mean after many years we realized that it was more important to look at how where we were how we were i mean it's it's really an unsystematic and you know it's the way of coping that everyone finds but i wonder if you found at least evidences of a uh, I, I realize that you work with allergic subjects that had like scientific proofs of their so it was a yeah. kind of easier at least at least as, at a sort of ground level mm -hmm. um, you know, there was like a, an immediate uh, uh, marker to, mm -hmm. to be found. But I, I, I was curious to know if in their responses, then there was a certain varieties that um, could be actually better understood through psychosocial research and a certain type of uh, 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 expansion in the embodied memory and in the relationship between the skill sets, the embodied memory and their actual uh, sufferings. Um, rather than just you know trying to um, policy the way they eat, like the ingredients, the sources, the mm -hmm. the processing, uh, and and actually the processing is a is another interesting part because sometimes, uh, I guess you know you, you you found it out. It's sometimes the processing that makes it uh, actually worse because it, uh, it it what's gets out certain allergens mm -hmm. rather than others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a really interesting um, question. I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to answer it to your satisfaction or if I'm even hitting the right point, but feel free to tell me. Um, one of the interesting things among the people that I've been working with is uh, discussions about good and bad doctors, mm -hmm. right? And in Japan, I'll be talking about this at the AAS next week, um, there is a really famous doctor um, who basically... Um, is very against oral immunotherapy treatment mm -hmm. and is very much about figuring out all of the potential allergens and sensitivities through blood work, which can be problematic, uh, and telling the person and the entire family to cut those allergens mm -hmm. and to basically work on facilitating a healthy microbiome mm -hmm. uh, through fermented food, through lifestyle, through cutting down mold, through not eating oils, through all of these different things. And the idea there is that um, you would reset the microbiome, although this is it's very debated about among the women I work with uh, and, and in the medical uh, world as well. Um, so that's their strategy, and it's really an all-encompassing 
an incredibly difficult um, way of living for these families because many of these people are found to have multiple, you know, 10, 15, 20 allergens in their blood work, but they may not actually be having physiological responses to those allergens. And so normally now in biomedicine, it's only if you're having an immune response when you eat it, so they do food challenges, that then they tell you to cut it because it's, it's a huge lifestyle burden, right? Um, so among the parents I've been working with, there are people that are like really involved in this kind of lifestyle cutting thing. And then there are people that are really biomedical. We're doing oral immunotherapy. We're going to try and increase sensitization. We're going to do everything that we possibly can to minimize the burden of this so that they can lead a normal life, right? Um, as to how psychosocial comes into that, um, it's, it's kind of a very individual and family-oriented response. So, you know, one woman um, asked her eight-year-old, took the eight-year-old to the doctor and said, you know, this, the doctor explained to her, this is what oral immunotherapy treatment is, this is what it will involve, this is what you have to do, uh, you, have to, you have to eat this for at least a year, probably longer, and then we'll keep testing you. Uh, do you want to do it? And left the decision in her hands, and she feels very in control of her allergens. Um, others don't have that approach, and their kids respond in different ways. Some are, you know, just da 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 da, da. Others respond like um, I, I discussed earlier with um, really high levels of anxiety. So I don't think that answers your question, but... No, I have to okay, you have to, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you so much. <laughs>